joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. I think as many times as I sang that growing up as a child in church, did you? As many times as I did? I'm not sure I ever really understood what it meant. Certainly I never knew where it came from in the Bible. In the heart of this setting of the people of God in Nehemiah's day, who have returned from exile to a broken down, burned out city of Jerusalem. And yet here it is in the heart of chapter eight in Nehemiah and it's couched in an instruction that Nehemiah gave to the people of God who have come together around God's word. Did you think as you sang that song as a child like I did that it was all about ha 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 happiness. <laughs> well, maybe now that we're grown-ups, we should figure out what this joy really is and how this joy strengthens us as the people of God, as we live in a world in which so many things threaten our joy, don't they? And sap us of strength. Now, I think I understand what joy is in general, or at least I think I know what it means to want to be happy. I mean, I've chased after all kinds of things that I thought would make me happy. Perhaps it started for me with chasing boys at recess at David Brewer Elementary School. I mean, who of us has not thought that if we could only catch the right boy, that then we would be happy. Some of us have chased after a particular position in a particular company or organization that we thought would make us happy, only to discover that we were thrown in with coworkers or bosses or leaders who made us crazy instead of happy. And others of us have thought that if only we could create the family of our dreams made up of just the right number of healthy children that never squabble with each other and beg for family devotions to begin, (laughs) that then we would be happy. Clearly, we need something more solid than is being described here by Nehemiah. And it would seem that what is being described here is not merely a joy that you and I can create for ourselves or for each other. This is the joy of the Lord. It is the Lord's joy. And you see, the Lord intends for his joy to be our joy. So what is the joy of the Lord? And in what way was the joy of the Lord, God's very own joy, the strength of these returned exiles in the city of Jerusalem in Nehemiah's day? And what would it mean for this same joy, the joy of the Lord, to be our strength as we live out our days, not ensconced behind walls of stone in the city of Jerusalem, but wherever it is that we call home? Now, before the events of Nehemiah, when these people were living in exile, before they came back to Jerusalem, the psalmist says that they sat down and wept by the waters of Babylon when their captors wanted them to sing songs of Zion. And they said, how shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? They said, if I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. Let my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you. If I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. The highest joy for the people of God was and is to be at home in God's city. And that's God's joy as well. And it's actually the first answer to our pursuit to discover what the joy of the Lord is from these two chapters, chapter 7 and 8. 
And here it is, that the Lord's joy is bringing his people into the security of his city. Open your Bibles with me, if you haven't already, to Nehemiah chapter 7. We read beginning in verse 1. Now when the wall had been built, and I had set up the doors, and the gatekeepers, the singers, and the Levites had been appointed, I gave my brother Hanani and Hananiah, the governor of the castle, charge over Jerusalem. For he was a more faithful and God-fearing man than many. And I said to them, let not the gates of Jerusalem be open until the sun is hot. And while they're still standing guard, let them shut and bar the doors. Appoint guards from among the inhabitants of Jerusalem, some at their guard posts and some in front of their own homes. He tells us the city was wide and large, but the people in it were few and no houses had been rebuilt. I have to think that Jerusalem still looked like a war-torn, bombed-out city like we see on the news today, where there were piles of rubble where there used to be homes. I mean, this was not exactly the kind of neighborhood that anybody wanted to move into with their kids. It's a city up on a hill which made it a very dangerous place to live. And so when the exiles returned home from exile, though their hearts had longed for Jerusalem, most didn't move back in there. Instead, they settled in outer towns and villages that were surrounding the city. In fact, in Nehemiah's day, only a few brave souls were actually living in the city of Jerusalem. But this was to be a place where God's people could dwell at peace, worshiping him and shining as a light to the Gentiles. And so Nehemiah began taking steps to secure the city so that God's people could live there. His brother, Hanani, you remember him from chapter 1, right? He's the one who cared enough about these people in this city to make that four-month-long journey to Susa to tell Nehemiah about the great trouble and the great shame of his people. So he, along with Hananiah, who was the governor who had been appointed by the Persian ruler, this one who evidently feared God, as Paige has so ably showed us, he feared God more than he feared men. These two were put in charge. Guards were set at the gates to ensure the security for those who lived inside. Because the intention of Nehemiah and the joy of the Lord is that those who lived in this city would dwell secure. But that does beg the question, who should live in this city, the Lord's city? behind these rebuilt walls? Who should populate this city that is at the very center of God's salvation purposes? Well, let's look in verse 5 of chapter 7. Then my God put it into my heart to assemble the nobles and the officials and the people to be enrolled by genealogy. And I found the book of the genealogy of those who came up at first. And I found written in it these were the people of the province who came up out of the captivity of those exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried into exile. They returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to his own town. They came with Zerubbabel, Jeshua, Nehemiah, Azariah, Rehemiah, Nehemoni, Mordecai, Bilshan, Mispereth, Bigvi, Neam, and Baana. Okay, if you're rebuilding a city, but more than that, which more than that was happening here, if you are restoring a people to live in that city who will worship God in the way in which he is worthy, where do you begin determining, determining who is going to populate the city? Well, Nehemiah began by pulling out the list of the families who were the first ones to return to Judah when the doors were thrown open. We actually read about these people back in the previous book in Ezra 1.5 where we read, Then rose up the heads of the fathers' houses of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites, catch this, everyone whose spirit God had stirred to go up to rebuild the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem. You see, the reality of that day 
was that returning to the Jewish homeland, it just really wasn't all that tempting for most Judeans who had settled into a way of life wherever it is they had been carted off to. But there were some, there were some whose spirits had been stirred up by God to go back. Nehemiah intends for Jerusalem to be inhabited by those whose hearts burn for the city of God because the spirits of God had kindled that fire within them. Look back in chapter 7. We see that Nehemiah lists the people who, had, who made their way back from exile to Judah 90 years earlier. First, verses 8 through 38. Can you see it there in your text? We have the list of just ordinary citizens. Then verses 39 through 42, the list of priests. Verses 43 through 45, the list of Levites, the singers, the temple servants, Solomon's servants. And then it tells us about those who claim citizenship and membership in the priesthood, but they, they didn't have the records to demonstrate that that was the case. Now, I know you guys are really wishing that I would read through this long list of difficult to pronounce names. I don't have either the height or the courage of Tim Keller like he did last night to do that. And besides the very idea kind of takes me back to my childhood Sunday school classes when I got that assignment and stumbled through it and felt like a fool. So uh, I'm not going to read those names. You know, the truth is when we come to lists of names like this in the Bible, we're tempted to think names, they don't really matter. Oh, but they do. If we had started at the beginning of God's story of redemption in the Old Testament, surely as we read through this list of names, they would begin to ring some bells for us. We would recognize that these are the descendants of Abraham, the ones to whom God promised he would give this land. These are members of the nation that was brought out of slavery to live in this land of milk and honey. These are the descendants of those that God drove out of the land because of their spiritual adultery and disobedience with the promise that they would one day be replanted in the land. Most significantly, these are the ones, are the people through whom the promised one is going to come. The descendant, the descendant of Abraham, through whom all of the families of the earth will be blessed. The returnees, mostly of the tribe of Judah and Benjamin, they are now the people of God. They are the inheritors of the promises that were made to their forefathers. In verse 7, Nehemiah makes a list of the leaders, and there are 12 of them. Just as God's people were once led by 12 sons of Jacob, and just as God's people will in the future be led by 12 apostles here in Nehemiah, it's being signaled to us that this, these are now the people of God by the record that they are led by 12 men who whose spirit God has stirred up to go and rebuild the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem. Now we also know that there are those in this list who were not descendants of Abraham, but they had joined themselves to the people of God because they wanted in on the promises of God. Ezra 6 describes those who first celebrated the Passover in the land and Ezra writes that it was eaten by the people of Israel who had returned from exile and also by everyone who had joined them and separated himself from the uncleanness of the peoples of the land to worship the Lord, the God of Israel. So just as we know that there were Egyptians who joined to God's people when they walked out of Egypt, and just as we know that there were Canaanites and Moabites like Rahab and Ruth, who became a part of God's people by forsaking false gods to worship Yahweh alone. We see that in Nehemiah's day, God was adding people 
from throughout the lands conquered by the Persians. You see, God has always and always will be about the work of bringing people from every tribe and tongue and nation to himself. And oh, my friend, aren't we grateful to know that? That we, who were once alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, are now no longer strangers or aliens, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Are we not grateful to know that our names are included on the list of those whom God's spirit has stirred up to walk away from the Babylon called this world so that we might enter into the city of God and find our security there. My friends, here is the joy of the Lord that can be your joy as you read these long list of unpronounceable names, and it is that God's people are not nameless, faceless people to him. The Lord's joy is recording the names of his people in his book. God likes to keep lists of those who are his people because his people as a group matter to him and his people as families matter to him and his people as individuals matter to him. Their names are written in his book. We read about this book throughout the scripture. Perhaps the first place is in Exodus. You remember this when Moses was willing for his name to be blotted out of God's book in exchange for forgiveness for his people. The psalmist writes about the Lord's book in whom, in which the names of those enrolled among the righteous, it says, are found. Later, the prophet Daniel wrote that God's people will be delivered. And who will those people be? Daniel writes, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. In fact, Jesus said, what was the cause for joy? Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. There, my friends, is joy that gives us strength. The joy that the Lord takes in writing our names in his book as those who live securely in his city the new Jerusalem with him forever. Knowing that our names are written in heaven, it strengthens us for living life on this earth. You see, we can face disappointment and disaster, and ultimately, we can face death strengthened in the knowledge that our lives cannot be ruined. They cannot be snuffed out. Our names will not be, cannot be blotted from his book. Here's how the chapter ends in verse 73. So the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, some of the people, the temple servants, and all Israel lived in their towns. And when the seventh month had come, the people of Israel were in their towns. Now, you and I tend to read right through that time stamp there of the seventh month because we don't immediately grasp the significance of it. But you see, just as the seventh day was holy to the Lord for Sabbath rest and just as the, Sabbath, the seventh year was holy under Mosaic law so that the land, the ground, was given a Sabbath rest, so the seventh month was set apart as something special. Back in Leviticus 23, we read that the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel saying, in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall observe a day of solemn rest, a memorial proclaimed with blast of trumpets, a holy convocation. 
a holy convocation. That's what's happening when we read the first verse of chapter 8. And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. All these people who are living in their town surrounding Jerusalem, they've converged onto the city. Now, we might think, okay, they're, they're coming to go to the temple, but that's not the case. You know, women were limited to the outer courts of the temple, and only priests could go into the innermost areas of the temple. And here are gathered, look at verse 2, are gathered both men and women and all who could understand what they heard. There's 50,000 people gathered at the busiest intersection of the city, the place where people go in and out day by day to get water. I have to think that perhaps it looked something like Times Square in New York City on New Year's Eve. And yet these people aren't gathered to watch a ball drop. They're gathered to hear a book read. They've gathered to rediscover and recapture their identity as the people of God. It says they've gathered as one man, meaning they have a unified desire. They want to hear God speak to them through his written word. Look at the second part of verse 1. It says, And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. I don't know exactly what it was like when it says that they told is Ezra. But perhaps there were a few people scattered throughout the crowd that begin to say, bring out the book. And maybe a few more joined in calling out to Ezra, bring out the book. And then, until it was 50,000 voices strong, they thundered, bring out the book. You know, most people today would scoff at the idea that the central source to discover the reality of who you are, or who you were created to be, or what you were meant to do, could be found in the pages of an ancient book. And maybe we presume that that would be actually more believable in Nehemiah's day. But consider that when the events we are reading about took place, the book of the law that they're calling for him to bring out was already a thousand years old. And consider that these are people who've never heard the voice of God speaking to them from a mountain that was on fire, like their ancestors did at Sinai. They, they've never seen a cloud of fire hovering over the temple to signify God's presence among them like their ancestors did in Solomon's day. But they did want to hear from God in their day. So how will that happen? And how can we expect to hear God speaking to us in our day when we've never heard an audible voice or had a supernatural experience? God speaks to us, revealing to us who he is and what he has done, helping us to understand who we are in relationship to him through his written word. The people that are gathered at that water gate that day, they're, they're not hungry from some sort of spiritual experience apart from God's word. They're not heading out to find a place to be alone where they might silence themselves and listen to hear some special word spoken to them in their private th thoughts apart from God's word. They're hungry to hear God speaking to them in the way that they will know for sure it is his voice that they are hearing. Oh, that God might raise up women in our day who are hungry for the book. Hungrier for the book 
than we are for an inspirational or entertaining experience. Hungrier for the book than we are for Pinterest-worthy aesthetics. <laughs> Hungrier for the book than for good advice to solve what we see as our most significant problems. Hungry to hear God's voice break through the busyness of raising children and the ding of another email message arriving and the draw of popular bloggers willing to let God set the agenda for the conversation, open to what he has to say, even if it doesn't sit well with us, invested in growing in a right understanding of his word, convinced that what he says is the surest truth, the most solid foundation, the most nourishing food, and certain that his promises are our surest expectation and that obeying his commands will generate our deepest joys. Oh Lord, would you forgive us? Would you forgive me for demonstrating again and again, day by day, through our choices in what we watch and what we read and what we listen to that we don't really believe that what we need most is your book. That we don't really believe that we live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. In verse 3, we read that Ezra read it. He read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. So they not only ask for the book, they're attentive to the book. They're not merely just going through the motions of showing up while their thoughts are elsewhere, which can we just admit is oftentimes the case for us when we gather to hear the book read and taught, they're taking in God's word, they're thinking it through, they're seeking to understand it, apply it. Here's the picture. Ezra is standing on a big wooden platform they've built for just this purpose. It's not a spontaneous gathering. It's been planned for and prepared for. And Ezra opens up the book, the scrolls of Genesis and Exodus, Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy and he begins to read from dawn until about noon. They listen to Ezra read. You see, they haven't come to hear Ezra's ideas or to hear more about Nehemiah's plans. They've come to hear the living God speak to them through his written word and so they stood to receive it. In verse 6, it says, Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads, and they worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. You see, they're not just listening politely or passively. Their very posture is a reflection of what's happening in their hearts as they open themselves to welcome and affirm and submit to all that God has to say to them. Ezra's surrounded by Levites who, according to verse 7, it says, look there, that he helped the people understand the law while the people remained in their places. They read from the book the law of God clearly and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. Perhaps Ezra read from Genesis about the curse and the promise in the midst of the curse of that seed of the woman who will crush the head of the seed of the servant, serpent. And the Levites worked their way through the groups of people in the large gathering explaining what it meant. How the curse explains why the world doesn't work right. And how humanity began to wait for this baby to be born, this one who would finally someday put an end to the curse. Perhaps Ezra, Ezra read to them about the Tower of Babel and the confusion of languages. You see, most of these people likely spoke Aramaic 
and no longer understood Hebrew, but as the Levites translated and explained God's word to them, they began to understand that God would not allow the effects of Babel to keep his people from hearing and understanding his word. As the people of God gathered at the water gate that day and understood God's word, they took in the promise that was made to Abraham of a great name, a great nation, a vast land, a promise of a descendant through whom all the families of the earth would be blessed. And they heard about how Abraham's family became a nation, a nation in captivity in Egypt to whom God sent a deliverer to redeem them from slavery. How they must have groaned when Ezra read about their nation's disobedience in the wilderness. As they listened to God speaking through Moses in Deuteronomy, pro promising them blessing if they would obey and curses if they disobeyed, surely they put it together with the reality that their fathers experienced all of the curses that were warned about in the ancient book. And Nehemiah tells us in verse 9, all the people wept. You know, some people hear the word of God read and explained, and they feel nothing. There's a hardness to it. A lack of response to it, but not on this day, and not these people, as they took in all that God had done for their, his people, all of the promises that he had made to them, all that he had commanded them to do and be, all of the patience he had shown to them, it penetrated them so deeply that they were moved to tears. You know, the word of God, Hebrews says, is sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And clearly, the word of God cut deeply into the lives of these people gathered that day, exposing all of the ways they had fallen short of the glory of God. They saw the incongruity of their lives in relation to God's law, their lack of gratitude for God's provision. And they wept. Tears began to trickle down their faces as they heard and understood and felt the weight of the failure of God's people over the centuries to be all that they were intended to be. And certainly, this record of rebellion and their growing awareness of the reality of their own spiritual condition was worthy of weeping over. And the time is coming for tears of repentance, as we'll see in chapter 9. But this wasn't the time. Look in verse 9. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and the scribe, and the Levites who taught the people said to all the people, this day is holy to the Lord. Do not mourn or weep. Well, those gathered at the water gate that day heard of the repeated disobedience and the failure of God's people throughout the centuries. You see, that's not all they heard. They heard about God's provision of a way to be forgiven, a way to be cleansed, a way to experience, at least in part, the restoration of relationship that God began working out so long before in the garden. They saw in shadows the Redeemer who would accomplish this full restoration. You see, as Ezra read the law of Moses, and as the Levites moved among them to explain it, they understood the significance of so much in their lives that had likely devolved into meaningless religious ritual. In Genesis, they would have heard about how God provided a substitute, a ram caught in the thicket so that Abraham didn't have to sacrifice his son Isaac. 
when Ezra got to Exodus. They would have heard how God made a provision for a lamb to be sacrificed for every household on Passover night in the place of the firstborn. When Ezra got to Leviticus, they would have heard God's instructions for a day of atonement when a single animal would be sacrificed for the sins of the whole nation of Israel. You see, it was pictured for them again and again that anyone who wants to be made right with God can do so on the basis of the lamb that God has provided. They couldn't see clearly the perfect lamb that God was going to provide. But as they heard and as they understood the book of the law as Ezra read it, it nurtured in them a longing for the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. When we hear God's word read and taught, it does much more than reveal our sin. It reveals our Savior. God's good word to his people is that our sin will not get the final word in our lives. His grace and mercy will get the final word. The joy of the Lord is this grace toward sinners that you and I can understand even better than they did in Nehemiah's day because we live on this side of the cross and we can read and understand the whole Old and New Testament. Because of grace, when we hear and understand God's word, we're not just left to simmer in a pool of regret and shame. Sorrow over sin must give way to joy. Knowing that it is the Lord's joy to extend grace to sinners gives us strength to live for him and love him instead of run from him. On this day, Ezra and Nehemiah wanted the wonder of God's saving purposes for his people, his patience toward them, his presence with them, his provision for them, his continued promises to them to prompt celebration, not tears. Ezra and Nehemiah instructed the people to celebrate with a feast. Look in verse 10. He said, go your way, eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready for this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So he's telling them to go and feast. And, you know, this command, a feast, doesn't come out of the blue. They had heard Ezra read about God setting a feast, really, before Adam and Eve in the garden, of the fruit of every tree but once, but one. And, of course, instead of eating what God commanded them to eat, what he had set before them, Adam and Eve took and ate what they were commanded not to eat, and in this way they ate and drank judgment upon themselves and all who would come after them. But as the people of God gathered at the water gate to worship him, to, to listen, they were learning about the way back into fellowship with God and that that was also by taking and eating of his provision. As Ezra read Numbers, they heard about the table that God spread before his people in the wilderness, raining down manna and bringing water out of a rock. They heard of his command to worship and commune with him by partaking of feasts and festivals outlined in the book of Leviticus. And they began to understand that the feasts God had instructed them to celebrate, they weren't some kind of empty tradition or meaningless ceremony, but everyone was an invitation to eat and drink at God's table. Every one of them was a welcome back into fellowship with him, and they wanted in. Verse 12 says, all the people 
went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to, and to make great rejoicing, joy, because they had understood the words that were declared to them. Great rejoicing. They understood that the joy of the Lord is his people partaking of his feast. To eat the fat and drink the sweet wine, it was a tangible way of partaking of the grace of God, his promised provision. It demonstrated trust in his ultimate provision, which was made manifest when on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this, and as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. You know, week after week, as we gather as God's people, and the word of God is read, and we're given the sense of it so that we understand it and we rightly feel the weight of our failure to be all that God has intended us to be. But he doesn't send us away in sorrow. Instead, we're invited to his table where we feast on his broken body and shed blood so that we leave with great rejoicing the joy of the Lord. We find that partaking in the Lord's feast fills us with the Lord's joy. And this joy gives us the strength to believe that our sins have been fully and finally dealt with in the sacrifice of Christ. This feast strengthens us to live lives that reflect the holiness of our God. It strengthens us to share the provision of God with those who have none. Because you see, we simply cannot fill ourselves up on the feast provided for us in the person of and work of Christ and keep it to ourselves. We have to share it so that the joy of the Lord this salvation feast will become their joy too. Verse 13 says that on the second day, the heads of father's houses and all of the people with the priests and the Levites came together to Ezra the scribe in order to study the words of the law. And they found it written in the law that the Lord had commanded by Moses that the people of Israel should dwell in booths during the feast of the seventh month. So on this day, did you catch the difference from the earlier day? The earlier day, we were told a couple of times, it was all the people who could understand, men, women, and here just the men have returned. Because remember that in Nehemiah, they're not just rebuilding a city. They're not just be rebuilding a wall, they're rebuilding a people. A people made up of families that need dad to lead out, not only in understanding, but in obeying. God's word. And as these as the fathers come together as they study it, they discovered that God required something that they and their ancestors hadn't been doing, or perhaps had only been doing in a token way for centuries. On the 15th day of the seventh month, they were supposed to make booths out of branches and live outdoors in them for a week. And as they slept in these makeshift shelters, they would be reminded of God's provision for their ancestors when they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years after being released from slavery. They'd also be reminded that they had been released from captivity and exile and brought back to the land by God's good hand. They would be reminded that they were in fact still a pilgrim people in the world dependent upon God's provision and presence, even though they were back and living in the land. And we read in verse 16, so the people went out and brought them and made booths for themselves. I just love this. 
they read in the book of the law that they should do it. And they did it. They went home and they gathered the family together. And these dads said, we're going to obey God. I mean, how many times have we read something in the Bible or we've heard the word taught clearly to us, showing us something we know we ought to do. And we think to ourselves, yeah, I should do that. But then we sing the closing hymn and we walk away and we put it out of our minds because we're really more concerned about what we're going to eat for lunch. What happens here is completely different. They read about this forgotten festival of tabernacles and they immediately made booths for themselves and they lived in them for 10 days. Now, did this obedience make them miserable? Look at verse 17. And there was very great rejoicing. There it is again, joy. You see, the joy of the Lord is his people living in glad obedience to his word. And I just wonder, have you discovered this joy of the Lord? Have you discovered that saying yes to God's commands will actually bring you greater joy than whatever it takes? is that tempts you to ignore or defy what God has commanded? That's how it was for them. The festivals of shelters pointed back to that time in the desert when God's presence was manifest among his people in the center of the camp in the form of the pillar of cloud and fire by night. And the shelters also pointed forward. Forward to the day that John describes in his gospel when he says, the word became flesh and tabernacled, made his home among us. And as they heard that and anticipated that day, when God's presence would be manifest among his people in flesh and blood, it gave them joy. My friends, the day is coming when we will experience all that is celebrated in the Festival of Shelters. We'll finally live in our forever home where we will enjoy the presence of God in our midst and we will remember how he rescued us from the land of our slavery to sin and how he brought us out. How he brought us out of the wilderness of this world and into the safety and security of our eternal home and there will be very great rejoicing. Outrageous overflowing, unending joy. The joy of the Lord is my strength. You see, it's the Lord's joy to bring his people into the security of his city. Just as Nehemiah set guards at the gates of Jerusalem, let me tell you, God has set his guard at his gate. In fact, Jesus is not only the one who stands guard at the gate. Jesus is the gate. He is the way by which we enter into the city of God. And oh, the safety that you and I enjoy because of Christ. He says about those who have come into the safety of his fold, the Lord's city, I will give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one can snatch them out of my hand. Oh, the joy of putting down roots and making our home in the city of God, knowing that we're safe, safe from the enemy of our souls, protected from the wrath we rightly deserve. That is joy that gives us strength. It gives us strength we need to live as aliens and strangers in the city of man, 
free from fear about the future. You see, we don't have to live in fear of the impact of the national debt or a nuclear threat. We don't have to be afraid of a national or natural disaster or a terminal diagnosis. One day, we're going to be welcomed into the New Jerusalem and Revelation says it's going to be surrounded by a great high wall with 12 gates. The walls of this city, it says, will be built of jasper and the foundations of the wall of the city will be adorned with every kind of jewel. And unlike the gates of Jerusalem in Nehemiah's day, which were shut and barred to keep her enemies out, the gates of the New Jerusalem will never be shut. But we also know that nothing unclean will ever enter that city. Oh, don't you long for the day when you will enter into the complete security of the Lord's city. Is your confident expectation of that day bringing you joy now? My friends, the joy of the Lord is his joy in having the names of his people written in his book. In Revelation 21, John tells us that only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life will populate the new Jerusalem. An entrance into that city won't be based on blood coursing through our veins, but on the blood of the Lamb, which covers and cleanses away our sin. And I promise you, we will not be bored when that list of names is read. <laughs> we will be on pins and needles listening for our names. Oh, what joy we will experience on that day when our names are found written in the book of life. The psalmist writes that every day of my life was written in your book before one of them came to be. You see, ladies, the joy of having our name written in his book, that's what strengthens us to face every day of our lives that is written in his book. Especially the day the accident happens. Especially the day we get the phone call. We discover the ugly secret. That day our dream dies. The joy of the Lord is that you would hear and understand and obey his word. Oh, the joy of that day when everything that Ezra read about from the book of the law will come to its full consummation. The seed of the woman will have destroyed the seed of the serpent. The people of God will have come through the wilderness of this world and into the promised land. And all who were unclean and have been made clean by the blood of an all-sufficient sacrifice will on that day be made holy to live in God's presence in the ultimate holy of holies called the new heaven and the new earth. And on that day, not just 50,000 people but a great multitude. And not just descendants of Abraham, but people from every nation, tribe, and tongue will stand, and not at the water gate, but around the throne, crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And we'll gather around God's word, which we will hear, not read by Ezra, but spoken by the very mouth of God. And we'll hear with our ears a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. And everything that the Festival of Tabernacles was intended to picture and promise will have become the reality that you and I will live in forever. Forever. 
this promise, a promise that brings the Lord great joy, provides you and me with the strength we need to live now in light of that coming day. The joy of the Lord is his people partaking in his feast. And as we enter into the new Jerusalem on that day, we'll be invited to sit down to eat the fat and drink sweet wine. And together we will cry out, hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come. Oh, my friends, why would we ever settle for the happiness that this world offers when we are being invited into the joy of the Lord? Why would we ever search for the happiness that our hearts long for anywhere other than the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. Because there, we will come under the security of his protection. There, we will be counted among his people, finding our name written in his book. There, we will hear his voice like never before and understand his word like never before and serve him with glad obedience like never before. And there, we will partake in his feast to our full and unending satisfaction. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Let's pray. Oh Lord, how good of you that you would be willing to allow your joy to be our joy. And Lord, would you forgive us for seeking after happiness, such flimsy imitation happiness in this world, rather than coming to your word, seeking to hear and understand it and obey it, believing that that will actually bring us our deepest, unending, satisfying joy. Lord, we look in your word and we're saddened as it does its work in us and reveals our sin and we can't help but see our own failure to be all that you have intended us to be but lord thank you for not leaving us there thank you that we not only see our sin more brightly and beautifully we see our savior and lord jesus we love you thank you for opening up the gates of your city thank you for being the way in thank you for writing our names in your book for giving us your spirit that has stirred us up to long for coming into your city. Thank you for speaking your word to us and thank you for the feast which you are even now preparing to share with us. It will be that day, a day of great rejoicing. In your name I pray, amen.